Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. I'm really happy to have Stefan Lederer, who is the co-founder and CEO of Bitmovin, which is at bitmovin.com. Welcome to the show, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Welcome to everybody listening and watching. Uh, Bitmovin is a company that is um, on the forefront of, of distributing or, you know, developing um, you know, encoding technology and delivering video content, you know, end to end, right? We are an infrastructure provider for um, the different components of a video infrastructure, video streaming stack. Um, we provide um, video encoding solutions, video player solutions, video analytics solutions um, for customers worldwide um, with a focus on tier one accounts. Um, in the U.S., um, a good portion of the top 10 um, streaming services work with us the one way or another. And um, so we, we see ourselves as um, the infrastructure software people, um, enabling people and companies to build products similar to Netflix and Twitch and the like. But you're, are you a, basically a white label? Because, I mean, you're, you know... Right. Exactly, exactly. We integrate into um, like branded platforms as well as in um, like um, platform products for end users as well as like for, for B2B use cases. Um, so we are pretty versatile, like a toolbox to build any video streaming um, customer facing or B2B um, product. So uh, I know a couple of your clients are Fubo, right? And the BBC, is that correct? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what do you do for them and or some other clients? Yeah, so for the BBC, we do, for example, um, the video encoding for the high quality streams and video on demand assets. Um, they just publicly um, kudos us for the improvements that we help them to accomplish in terms of turnaround times, time to market for those contents. Um, and the quality that they gain out of that. Um, that was a nice one. Um, Fubu TV, we do the live streaming of um, a range of um, like live streams that they have running, um, high quality premium um, content streams. And um, yeah, basically I was integrated on the player side and um, uh, working with them quite since a while. It's a great experience with those customers. There are just two public examples out of um, a list of like 400 customers worldwide with um, similar use cases on video encoding side for life and um, on demand, um, as well as on play of um, topics for all types of platforms, um, as well as like analytics topics when it comes to like stream optimizations, which became quite popular in this time of like mass consumption of video content during um, confinement and, and um, the COVID, COVID crisis. I know you're, at, um, you're an industry observer, obviously, and have been fairly vocal about what's happening right now uh, in terms of who's doing a good job or a poor job in delivering a live stream experience. I mean, in, and, and delivering video in general is sort of the, you know, the, uh, the backbone of what's going on right now. You know, it's, it's in the hot seat. It's, it's, combined, it's uh, bringing the entire sort of world community together in mm -hmm. their off times, right? Um, it's a it's an interesting industry to be in. Can you tell me a little bit about what you are seeing right now um, in terms of uh, where the streaming industry is going? And then also let's talk about who's doing a good job and who's doing a bad job. <laughs> um, we see definitely a trend and that's a multi-year trend towards online video. I think um, Disney did a pretty good job in like transforming as a, as a like, like tier one media company um, from like a distributor model um, of distributing the content to like a direct to consumer model. And um, I think that was a pretty bold move and that paid off for them even more now with um, the acceleration due to um, the um, like stay at home um, um, orders and um, the, the quarantines. And um, we see that's um, holding true for a lot of services that are launching right now that launched in the last couple of years. So the trend from traditional broadcast and linear 
um, distribution to online distribution in a video on demand matter on any device at any time is accelerating through what we see right now going on in the world for sure. Um, an interesting additional development that we see right now is the um, creation of new use cases and business models. Um, if you've seen, if you have seen, for example, Airbnb um, launching their um, their experiences, so um, those things you can book on the Airbnb platform with like locals that teach you cooking or other things or um, local dances and um, all types of stuff. They launched um, a virtual version of that um, like in within a few weeks, and that was pretty impressive. And we see that um, with um, our customers in, in, in various areas, like for example, one of our customers um, provided fitness subscriptions to, to um, customers and to physical um, like fitness studios and gyms and classes and stuff like that. And they switched to an online version of that because obviously fitness studios are closed. Um, so from that perspective, they really innovated and transformed the business um, very quickly to an online video um, experience. And we see the same thing in terms of education. Some of um, the media companies that we work with got tasked by their governments to distribute educational content for all the um, kids that are um, staying at home and cannot be at schools. And that accelerated the usage of some of those providers um, like by magnitudes of order. And um, that was obviously a challenge for them, but it was interesting to see the response of different countries and different media companies to the new realities and requirements out there. So um, we see currently probably an acceleration of online video use cases and business models, um, which basically accelerated, I think, the tra transition to those um, business models by years. So I think what we would have seen in two to three years from now happened now within two to three months. Yes, it's interesting, um, the idea that the lower level priorities have all of a sudden gotten to the very top, right? And, yeah. and that um, live streaming is becoming more and more a part of people's business models. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the educational market is going to continue to transform in that direction. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if the big, huge corporations start getting involved in education as well, like Amazon and Microsoft and Salesforce is already involved. But if they start taking over the real estate from Google Classroom, you know, which yeah. is dominant yeah. right now, it'll be interesting to see a sort of streaming wars and who will side with whom, who will, who will get hired. I think that's a huge marketplace for um, that is going to move towards transformation. So, um, exactly, exactly. Now, tell me a little bit about. Uh, I know you were very critical about um, the candidates' use of streaming. That, yeah. uh, for example, Joe Biden has not done a particularly good job, or his people in supporting messaging out of his camp. Tell me a little bit about what you've seen, and if you've seen any improvement, or w why you think that's obviously critical. Yeah, I mean, we saw a couple of um, live um, events or, or, or sessions, um, especially from the um, Biden campaign, that was not on a level where um, you would imagine it. Um, I think there are much better examples in the same camp. So um, the New York governor, governor Cuomo did a much better job in terms of like his daily broadcasts and the quality of those. Um, we are living in a world where social media consumption of content like that um, is broadcast quality. And um, you see that with political content, you see that with YouTubers, you see that with um, many areas of content. The production quality just increased tremendously. And nobody needs like humongous equipment for that or, or, or um, budget for that. It's actually fairly reasonably possible in terms of like equipment needed and, and, and stuff. Um, I think here it's just like putting a little bit more effort in and maybe like doubling down on like um, getting the right skill set in place um, to host such um, events 
um, would be really beneficial. And I think um, some, like for example, the Kuomo live streams on a daily basis are pretty well produced. And I think that's something where you can easily get um, expertise um, to improve those things. Because, I mean, the viewership expects a certain threshold of content quality. And um, that is simply not there. I mean, it's, it gives definitely a little bit of a human aspect to it. If content is like streamed from a smartphone and, and things like that, um, it's definitely a nice touch. But um, not all of your content can be produced in that way. You need. Uh, do you expect? Um, I mean, wh what do you expect regarding the uh, conventions? Don't you think that the conventions are going to have to be very professionally live streamed? And and what and what do these candidates need to be uh, need to have put in place in order to make it a really nice looking, low latency experience? Professional teams for sure. Um, I think. Going forward, the like bar for those um, events, uh, so the conventions and everything, is going to be much much higher. You present yourself as a professional, and um, that's just part of it. Um, and I think that's something where we are going to see professional service providers working for those um, events and campaigns um, to come in and really bring this expertise. I mean, you have those folks, professionals that do that on a like daily basis, also pre-COVID, streaming huge live events and there are specialized companies in pretty much every city for doing that. And um, I think that's something that um, people just have to, to look at. With, professional internet connectivity, professional tools, um, expertise. That's something, even if you think you're a professional in the domain, if you haven't done it, um, you struggle with it. I remember there was a um, video developer conference in San Francisco um, and the, that happens on a yearly basis. And I remember two years ago, um, even, even this conference struggled to provide a um, working live stream. Um, if you imagine it's a conference of like hundreds of, of video developers and it just shows that those things can go wrong and that's it's not like it's it's it always seems um, to go wrong on on the stage of ces whenever they need to stream something or do a demo it always fails i mean exactly. that's, a, that's a generalized statement but it always seems to fail um exactly <laughs> what what is why is it so hard to live stream and where where are the edges of opportunity here? It's very difficult to upload videos to YouTube to get things to work, to get things encoded, to crunch videos quickly. I mean, it, it, uh, to compress, I mean, the whole business, all of the different touch points are still, I think, not good enough, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you have the ability to make them Good enough and great. We see that on a on a daily basis. I mean, um, Fubu is doing their live streams with us, and they work um, flawless. Um, there are the right technologies in place. Like um, there are also, I mean, if you want to produce a high quality um, event, you have to make sure that a couple of components are in place. I mean, that that starts with the on-site production crew. That they those people know what they are doing. Um, but then it continues to the contribution to um, the cloud. All of that stuff is cloud hosted nowadays. So what you need is basically good internet connectivity, but a good internet connectivity alone is not enough. You have variations and fluctuations on the internet connectivity for sure. That's going to happen. And you cannot prevent it, so you better plan for it. And therefore, there are technologies, proprietary and open source technologies for that. Um, SRT is an open source contribution format that um, compensates and adjusts to bandwidth um, problems. Um, same thing as Xixi on the commercial side. Those are technologies that basically eliminate this source of error, which is probably the most common source of error. And um, I think those things are possible if um, you just do the right things and use the right components and pipeline, um, then it's something you can get done. Well, all, Fairly simple. A lot of these, you know, all these new virtual conferences, 
you know, that are emerging, they're, they're using a range of different platforms out there. And, you know, there's always some kind of um, latency or somebody freezes. Some of the platforms are pretty good, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's frustrating to watch. I know we're doing a lot of research to make sure that we have all the right technologies in place where that's not going to happen. Um, how can Bitmovin help? I mean, there are two things to consider here. It's like um, a conference setting where you have interaction and social components, as well as a um, like one-to-many broadcast type of uh, stream. It's really hard to combine both. Um, I think where we are speci specialized is definitely the broadcast side um, of the house um, to make events scalable to large amounts of people in, in the highest quality. You mentioned low latency. That's an additional factor that comes into play for, for such deployments. Typically, you can have low latency or lowest latency in real-time communication with like a few people, a few participants, or higher latencies with like more, many, like millions um, or hundreds of thousands of participants. Are broadcasters reaching out to you at all to, to discuss um, live streaming? Because with the shutdown in production, you'd think that they might take advantage of that. Although here in California, they're starting to reopen that possibility of, of production. Mm -hmm. But I still think um, there must be some, some opportunities uh, to live stream we see content. them we see we see currently a quite a big of a demand to um jump in and help um live streaming actually reduced a little bit um in the meantime because of like the lack of live content in terms of sports for example because like those things were simply not happening a lot of customers needed to switch to video on demand content instead and um, just from a temporal basis, some so, needed to- So you're saying the broadcasters are not necessarily reaching out to solve, um, to produce new content that's live streamed, you know, like a live event, like, you know, NBC does occasional musicals, at least they used to, but yeah. you're not necessarily getting a lot of calls about original live stream content. That Isn't happens, right? that happens, but I think the majority was driven much more by the transition to video on demand assets. It's more like, hey, we suddenly need to provide our viewers a big library of video on demand content. Okay. Hey, can you encode and transcode um, like 5,000 assets from our library to make them available like tomorrow to our customer, to our viewers? Oh, I see. Yeah. And um, that changed now over the last weeks when things opened up again um, to actually um, like wise more on the live streaming side so over the last two months it started with a switch to from live to video on demand assets um and now back to life again as things are opening up in europe for example sport leagues are, are um, active again the same thing happens right now in the us and um so it's again like okay we have to back, switch back to normal but those um, um events are also happening on different um, locations like different leaks are coming up with different strategies to um, end the season some happens uh, happen in their existing um, facilities some switch out to switch to like Disney World for example to finalize the season and um, I think the NBA switches to Disney World if I'm not mistaken and that puts a lot of pressure to the broadcasters to um, like provide the infrastructure environment to get that done yeah. Are there any, um, is there any work being done to uh, improve the codex? I mean, are, are, are they fairly static right now or, you know, to, to, so that this could all be done even yeah. faster? What's yes, the absolutely. So there is codec innovation happening. Um, we saw the launch of HEVC, which is still in the middle of like getting into the market. There are new codecs available like AV1, um, which launched probably one and a half years ago still in the distribution and platform support gaining phase. Um, we see VVC up in the future in a year or two from now coming as a, again, more improved standard. And you switch quite a bit, like for example, from the commonly used H.264 to HEVC, 
you have a 50 percent efficiency gain from HEVC to VVC you have another 40 to 50 percent um, efficiency gain um, so there's a ton of possibility in new codecs in new streaming formats as well like for example um, CMF um, is a new um, common media format based on MPEG dash which allows low latency streaming of um, around two seconds and lower. Um, that's a new format that was pushed over the last years, which is now entering the market from a low latency perspective. And from a contribution perspective, formats like SRT are standards that contribute in a higher reliability to prevent outages and stuff like that. So the technology stack is completely there. Um, I think we have to just go further than just to the early adopters in terms of the technology adoption curve. We have to make sure that those technologies are getting into um, the main market, I would say, and um, that we use those things that are necessary right now. I mean, during the peak times of the, the, the um, COVID crisis, we saw traffic increases of um, 380% in terms of streamed gigabytes. And it's like nearly four times the traffic that our networks need to handle and YouTube and Netflix and all those services need to lower their quality to like address that. Um, and you can address those things also with more efficient codecs, which those companies are doing to a large extent. But I think for the rest of the market, there's a lot more to gain through those more advanced technologies. I think there is a lot of improvement potential there that's getting now accelerated through the need, basically. What do you think about the rise of distributed encoding and use of blockchain yeah. and things like that in the video streaming space? And we see some early we see some early signs of it i mean we by ourselves have a distributed cloud encoding we don't go that far to put it on the blockchain um because of just the sheer amount of data um the problem is you have to distribute the content and aggregate it again to actually stream it and we haven't really seen the benefit of the of the blockchain for that for our um use we rather distribute it on cloud infrastructure and cloud data centers. Um, that's very working extremely efficient for us. Um, I mentioned the BBC earlier, they could reduce the turnaround time from assets um, from more than an hour to um, less than eight minutes for um, their hour long assets. And um, I think that's a pretty good. Um, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's a pretty good sign to see like, hey, you can optimize through distributed encoding in the cloud quite a lot um, in terms of like time to market for those assets. And um, we still look for a blockchain use case that's um, providing a, a, a big value add to our customers, potentially on the DRM side and content protection side. Um, I think that could be a, an interesting use case. But the problem that we are seeing is you have a very large amount of devices and platforms that you have to support. And um, that's the reason there are standards um, to unify those different devices on a streaming format. And um, I think that's also necessary for things like that. If you want to use the blockchain in video environments, we need to have standardization around that, that device manufacturers and software manufacturers can rely on a common language and environment. And I think that's currently um, missing. Um, if you were, uh, um, I have to say, what is the most important thing today that uh, needs to change about, you know, the streaming industry? Uh, what is that? What, what would you say is the, the biggest priority today? I think, um, being a little bit more like open for new technologies. I think there is a lot of, there's a whole portfolio of new um, technologies available in terms of streaming performance, quality, latency, and um, things like that. Um, we are just not using them largely yet. 
And I think that's a big potential for the industry to take the next step in terms of user experience overall. And um, I think that's something that we are going to see in the, in the years to come. Do you want to name what those are? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, um, we have standards like um, HEVC and VB9 on the conversion side ready to go today. The only companies that are using VB9 today are um, um, Netflix, YouTube, and Hotstar in India, and a range of our customers. And it's perfectly ready to go. It's an open source technology, but um, it had never really got enough usage, I would say, although it's ready to go. And you can save 40% of your bandwidth on half of your viewership in most cases. Um, HEVC is similar. And also like the HDR support um, in those um, formats that you provide um, um, better color experience and picture experience to those um, um, users by the usage of HDR and a lot of services are not yet at the point where we provide that to their viewers. Um, and um, there are two things on that side. On the live streaming side, um, low latency HLS as well as um, MPEG-CMAF for low latency are two open technologies that are ready to go in terms of like providing a lower latency experience. Um, easily less than 10 seconds. Um, in many cases, it's even possible to go significantly lower than that towards like two, three, four seconds of a delay, which is a big improvement to the 30 seconds of a delay that you see in a lot of live streams around sport and things like that. So that are just a few examples of technologies that are possible. You also see huge gains in like per title and per asset encoding and compression where you pay attention to the complexity of the, of the content. You see more advanced streaming protocols like HTTP 2.0 or Quick that provide also additional benefits. So the ecosystem of infrastructure protocols and technologies and encoding standards is as is interesting is very interesting at the moment and i think um we can use them today and we can um, build products that have a better user experience through those technologies is there such a thing or is there anything on everyone's agenda that is like a, a stream that is interactive without having an additional layer of software, you know, or, or data on top of that? Is there a way to make video itself, the stream interactive through, you know, special use of, uh, like you mean with use of feedback as well and things like that? Um, just like, you know, to deliver interactivity into the entire fabric of the video itself without, uh, having to run it through an additional software layer where you're, you know, you're encoding, it, uh, you know, all that data or hotspots and things like that, just mm -hmm. to, where you could, you could build um, a video stream that was interactive. Yeah, we saw those models um, in and the deliver past. them like, like, I'm sorry, yeah. to, just to sorry, let me clarify, like, you know, Netflix is not able to deliver an interactive experience through like Apple TV units, right? In order yeah. to see their interact, like Bandersnatch or things like that, you have to watch it on a, on an iOS device. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why can't I mean, it's the software on the little box, right? But yeah. why can't the stream itself just be interactive? Why can't, wh why not? Yeah. I think you have limitations on various platforms. Like you have um, just the way how the client devices are, are accepting their streams is very different. But, but like why a, do you have to rely on the client device? Why can't just the video itself, the, yeah. you know, I think that's like an innovation coming, you know, it's further down the road. And that's the thing. That's where standardization needs to come into place to provide those frameworks that those hardware manufacturers are implementing. Right now, they basically go the easiest route or some go the cheapest route. Um, which is sacrificing a lot of those flexibilities. So there are some streaming devices out there that have really extremely limited capabilities to manipulate the video stream and interact with it. And um, typically, the cheaper the box gets, the less capabilities you have. 
and um, that's how it's not true for like the Apple TV, for example. But um, that are that are things where I think a more open a more open approach to video infrastructure stacks on those devices would enable us to do more interesting use cases and interactivity, for example, like you mentioned. Um, like Android has a pretty open system by nature. You can do pretty much everything you want there, um, which is pretty cool. Um, like an Apple TV is definitely a little bit more closed as an ecosystem um, for intentional reasons. I think that's um, to maintain the, the, the certain quality level but you sacrifice a little bit of the flexibility to try out new things as well. Well, uh, that's, um, that's, those are all my questions, I think. Uh, thank you so much for um, helping me understand um, what the sort of state of the video streaming and encoding business is, Stefan. Sure, sure. And uh, wishing you well, and hopefully you can help some of these entities out there, political entities out there do a better job Thanks so much, uh, Stefan. Um, you can reach him over at Bitmovin, which is bitmovin.com, of course. And uh, and that's it for now. Uh, I'm Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. Please reach out to me if you'd like to tell us what you're doing. And if you're okay, and you're in San Francisco, right, Stefan? Yes, sir. At least virtually. Thank you so much <laughs> for sharing your time with us and expertise. Cool. Bye. Thank you.